I will not say who you are, but I will we'll read your question out loud, and I will do my best to uh, answer those for you. First question I see here is how effective is the 12-step program for sex addiction? Um, this is my personal point of view. I think it's an essential part of the tool belt, um, but I don't think it's as a standalone. I don't think it, it gets deep enough. Um, I, I personally went through 12-step, by the way, but I didn't share with you. I'm somebody who struggled with sex and porn addiction in my early life and went through our program and came out the other end. And I did myself. I did go through 12-step. I liked my experiences with 12-step personally. A lot of my clients do go to 12-step to complement the individual work. Uh, as a standalone, I don't think it goes deep enough, but I do think it's an important element to add to your tool belt. So if you're going to 12-step, keep going. Certainly couple that with some sort of individual work. If you're just doing 12, uh, if you just if you're if you're in individual work and considering 12-step program, yes, look at it. I think it's a valuable tool. Uh, a question came in, it's almost like I'd just rather not know when my husband has fallen back into using and pretend it's not happening. How do we help when it just makes us feel worse and worse? Yeah, that's a hard one. Uh, that comes down to boundaries. There's a boundary talk. How much is too much information? How much do you want to know? When you're in a relationship, you're sort of in this little dance. There's a system that's created in a, in a relationship. And when it comes to an addiction, you don't, oftentimes partners tend to become enablers. Um, that's a terrible word. Nobody likes the word enabler, enabling this to happen. Something that's happening to me, I'm the one who's being the, the victim here. But if sometimes if we just avoid it and let the partner continue in a trance and don't get honesty out on the table, then the system continues. We're just enabling that addictive relationship and the behavior to continue without really ever getting at it. So... There's a risk here. The risk is you may feel worse. There's a risk that, guess what, the relationship may not make it. But you have to, it's a personal thing you have to ask yourself what, what's worth it. Is it worth to suffer silently and just continue? It's not ha act like it's not happening? Or do I risk going out there and trying to change it for the better? Okay, I'm going to scroll up here and try to get to everybody's questions. Um, is it possible that intense concentration on hobbies is in itself a form of medication as a way to avoid acting out? Um, yeah, I think that's a, a fair thing to say, but certainly it is a conversion thing we want to do. If you think about addiction, it's time and energy that we put into something, and energy is physical. A lot of times what people get out of sex addiction and porn is we get a lot of energy. It fills us up. So it's really important that we have hobbies and things to concentrate on. Now, but, that's to, but to get deeper, does that cure it? No, it does not. All it does is buy time. If, you're gonna get, if we just trade one compulsion for the other, you're still compulsive. You still can't sit still. You're still addicted to thinking, and you're still going to be irritable just because you're not looking at porn for two months and you're, doing, you're, you're all involved in um, and house, housekeeping or house and home improvement projects or, or uh, you know, working on Lego sets. That's important to have an outlet, but if you're only doing that uh, and not doing the deeper work and going after what's beneath your behavior, then you're just, again, all you're doing is addressing the behavior, skirting the surface, and not going deep enough. But hobbies are important, but they don't, that alone is not going to get the job done. Uh, let me go up to this other question. Bear with me, folks. I'm trying to scroll through this little window. Is there evidence that suggests that people who have improved their addictive sex behaviors begin to demonstrate addictive behaviors in other realms? Do we trade addictions? Uh, yes, but truthfully what we find here is actually sex tends to mean, and, you know, and, and I have George here too, so George might pipe in on this as well. I tend to find with our users that sex addiction is the last roundup. I get a lot of, we get a lot of people with cross addictions, people who have kicked, drinking, gambling, or uh, uh, drugs, alcohol, or shopping, or, or eating disorders. They've cleared all that up, but the sex addiction has been sitting around unnoticed, unchecked. And that's usually for us is the last roundup. Um, 
Is it possible that people get off sex addiction and throw it into another addiction like drinking or gambling? Of course it is. Anything's possible. But I was speaking from my personal experience, what I see here, not usually. Usually we get people who've gone, who've struggled with that, and they come here, and the sex addiction is the last roundup. The good thing is what we do here, a lot of the work we do here is scalable. It doesn't just deal with sex addiction. It deals with getting at what's beneath. And if you get at what's beneath, that's you're going to find that scales to lots of uh, maladies and, and situations in your life. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, I'm not going to say his name. This is so-and-so, significant other. It begins with a G. If there is still no real inti intimacy and honesty after nine months of counseling and 12-step work on indi is that an indication that your efforts are just not going to work? Um, maybe. It depends. We, you really, hopefully you're working with the right person that's getting at that block. Um, understand that oftentimes when you start to change, when, when you're in an, a marriage or, or a committed relationship, uh, addiction is sort of like it's part of the system of what you've become used to. And when you start to change that system, start to try to get sober and, and stop using these tools and stop acting out in a certain way, it doesn't necessarily get better. Sometimes it does, but sometimes the relationship changes, and change sometimes isn't comfortable. So I don't know if that's in your specific case, um, G's significant other, but if you've been doing step work in nine months and you haven't gotten anywhere, that's, that, that would be a red flag to me, yes. That's something you should – that means maybe you're either the counseling – where the work you're doing isn't effective, isn't getting at what you need, or you guys just need to have a heart-to-heart -heart and really what's salvageable, what do you really want out of your relationship. In order to prevent sex porn addictions, is it logical or reasonable to demand that a partner never view porn? Um, L, you can certainly try to do that. But trying to control somebody is just usually doesn't work. That falls in the realm of, of codependency. You can certainly they you can certainly have that's your boundary. If that's something say, you know, I don't I'm not comfortable with this and if you do that then I'm out of here or this just is there's some consequences. And if the person still continues to do it, then then, then that's the, the problem is on them. Um, insisting or putting um, blocks or you know, things on software that prevent people or filters, that's just really those are band-aids if, if an addict is in addict mode and wants to act out and doesn't have any real interest in, in really changing and doing the hard work they're going to act out so you, i think it's but to answer your question is it reasonable of course it is if that's something that's very uncomfortable for you and it's a boundary and you don't want that in your relationship either it's your it's your son or it's your husband or a brother or whomever who somebody who matters to you um that's that's certainly within your right but you have to be willing also to back that up because an addict will certainly cross lines and cross boundaries. They're going to test you. Can an addict ever feel satisfied with regular sex after they get clean from the addiction? Well, we, we sure hope so. That's what we're here for. Um, oftentimes, really, at the heart of, uh, I think when I was showing you one of the slides, there was a feeling that what's behind sex addiction about it is, is it an intimacy disorder and absolutely it is sex addiction and pornography in, in our opinion is the absolute is the antithesis of intimacy intimacy is into me you see and addicts hide addiction is about isolation it's the polar extreme of what intimacy is about and oftentimes people have no clue how great sex can be when you're present not without you don't need props you don't need porn in the background Oftentimes, addicts who are, when they're during sex, might be physically present with you, but they got that interior sort of amphitheater movie going on in their head, uh, maybe about a, a, a porn site that they just saw, and they're thinking about that rather than the person they're with. People just, the addicts just don't understand yet what it's like to be truly present with somebody. And when they do, the folks that come through here, we really work on that. And when you really can understand that you can be all the way in, fully present, the sex uh, with somebody you really love and respect. Uh, the sex is off the charts. It's the best sex you'll ever have. So, yes, can sex get better? Absolutely. Um, one person wrote, how do you get a young man to admit that he has a problem and get out of the denial phase? Oh, 
Well, all kinds of ways. People have tried interventions. You can try. It really depends on the young man and how young they are. Sometimes confronting an addict is the worst thing. It really depends on the person you're talking about. Is this person, uh, most people are, who have had enough are dying to get found out. Oftentimes addicts give themselves away. We leave trails all over the place hoping that somebody will just make an intervention. Some people are so in denial that they will act out with extreme anger if you confront them. So they, I really can't answer your question without knowing who the person you're talking about. It depends. Um, but we'll say that if this is an adult, and if they're in denial, uh, unfortunately for most addicts, they have to hit rock bottom before they really make a change. And rock bottom is, again, varying degrees. Some people lose everything. Some people have a health scare. Um, some people fail, uh, don't get a job. So it, it's all over the place. Each person's bottom is subjective. But some people have to have a real scare, a real loss to finally shake themselves out of that denial phase and look for help. But they have it's a personal decision they have to make. You can encourage, you can force, you can coerce, you can try all you want, but eventually it comes down to that person making a decision for themselves. Um, how do I know if my husband is addicted to porn? If he view if he previews porn more than how much then is he addicted? Um, well, I welcome you to go back and look at some of the, the on the slide here, what we do, and, and do some research. But I will tell you that if your husband's addicted to porn, usually it means there's usually a situational change. Is he, is he less present? As, as, is, is sex starting to stop? Or is it, is it change? Is he asking different things that you're not comfortable with? Or maybe sex has waned? For a lot of people who struggle with sex addiction, uh, pornography, masturbation, and fantasy is their sex life. They're not really interested in a true life person. So it can it it can go all over the place. But if you're seeing a lot of um, changes in your husband, uh, his availability, um, you know, the way he acts, uh, how you know the way he is in the bedroom, the way he's out of the bedroom, you have to is is he is he starting to tell little bits of white lies? Are you catching them in slippery lies? All those things. If he's showing those those signs, and yeah, he's probably someone who's going. He's, struggling with it in, in, in denial. Okay, I have a few more questions here. Let me get to as many as I can. Um, when people have worked through things, I just lost that, here we are. When people have worked through things, how can they make sure they don't let their guard down and feel confident in their sobriety? Well, you, you don't stop. Um, for a person who's in recovery, um, this is not a this, this is a lifestyle change. Just like if you're changing your diet, or if you're taking up exercise, uh, changing a lifestyle uh, is, is a lifestyle change. It's not something you just do a crash course. You take 12 steps, you go to counseling for a year, and you stop, and you're done. I'm a person who's been quote unquote sober for for a long, long time, and I still practice. I still practice. George still practices. The people who who really, uh, who really embrace sobriety? This is this is a lifelong thing. Dialogue work, reading, uh, replacing the addictive behaviors with healthy habits. Um, so, to answer your question, how can I stay on guard? You got to keep working. It's like chopping wood. Some people say once an addict, always an addict. I kind of believe that, and I don't mean that to be a bad thing. I think when you're an addict, that means you just have to be a little bit more aware, a little bit more uh, curious about yourself than most, and that's a blessing. So you don't let your guard down. You just keep doing the work. You keep going. If you go into meetings, keep going. If you have a spiritual practice, embrace that. If you have healthy hobbies and good friends, throw yourself into that. You know, practice your sobriety. Do you think a regular porn user can also still respect women? Um, yeah, I, I, I was a regular porn user, and I certainly respected women and had good relationships with women, so that was from my personal standpoint. And yeah, I, I would say that most of the people I see who come through here actually ha have very high opinions of women. They love their wives, they love their daughters, they love their girlfriends. Um, and I, you know, so it, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to, they do not have to be mutually exclusive. However, the, you make a good point, though, is por porn, people who use porn a lot tend to really objectify women. Uh, they do look at women as sex objects, and this is something that's been around since adolescence. The big thing we do here at Compulsion Solutions is to grow that, that old schema up, uh, to look at women as people, 
uh, just like you and I, uh, to not look at them as objects, not to not use objective language like that, look at that, look at those, but you know, to see the person, to give her a story. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think you can change. I think to answer your question, if someone just sticks with porn and never, um, some people look at porn, yeah, they, they certainly don't have respect for women. It, again, it depends, but people who go through uh, um, therapy learn to stop objectifying and see the, the person for the person. I mean, can they still respect women sincerely in the real world around them? Oops, sorry, that was part two of your question. Uh, the answer is yes, they can, if they do the work. Okay, I've come to, I think, all the questions I've seen. I'm not sure if anybody is still online or if you've checked off. Um, I'd would like to make sure I leave you with some information. Um, if anybody uh, does want to continue, um, and uh, e, uh, EH, I see your question. I'll get to that in just a second. I will make sure I'll leave my contact information and our website. So if anybody has questions, uh, uh, I, I get free assessments. I'm more than happy to talk to you about your situation and offer some help. And I'll let me get, there's a few more questions that just popped in, so let me get to that, then I'll get to um, contact information. There's a question here, is there a threshold in terms of the length of time that a person has been viewing porn that indicates that they are much more likely to need lifelong attention to their problem? Uh, I, I think so. Uh, it's a good question. I think that if you if somebody who's been doing this as a hobby, since say it's been Scott since middle school, um, it's been around longer. There's probably more things to unchange, unhinge, and, cha and, and, and I think that makes common sense. It's, that's common sense speaking. So uh, uh, there's not a magic number. We get all kinds. We get people here who've been looking at a porn since they were eight or act or been in sexually active since that age who get clean. And we've got people who just who sort of fell into porn later in life. But most of the people we see here started really young. Uh, so sex has been uh, use of porn, and masturbation, and fantasy has been really in uh, the young person's repertoire since for a long time. Um, but I would say, yeah, the longer it is, I think it's the harder to break. I think there is an exponential factor to that, yes. What are the chances that a sex addict can break their addiction without professional health counseling? Um, uh, if I said slim and none, I, that, that's just being glib. I, don't, I think there's always a chance to answer your question, uh, uh, JP. Uh, but people who struggle with sex addiction didn't get sick on their own. This is something that's been handed down and it's been taught to them uh, indirectly and directly. So to expect to get um, um, healthy on your own is, I think, you're, you're just kidding yourself. It takes a lot of hard work. Um, working with either a therapist or someone in a spiritual practice like a church, anything, uh, even a 12-step group, getting, starting the work is really important. Going, going this alone is just really not the way to go. Uh, what are three possible first steps towards a commitment to recovery? Uh, first of all, you know, if you look at the 12 steps of recovery, I think that really does a good job of talking about, first of all, if you're not, you have to be aware you have a problem. If there's no awareness, if you can't admit to yourself that you're powerless and there's a problem, then you're not, there's nowhere to start. That kind of goes back to the question earlier about how can I get somebody out of denial. That person has to come out of denial and be aware and really admit to themselves that they're powerless and this is a problem. Then they have to be committed to doing something about it, and sometimes that means bottoming out enough and finding resources. They need help. A lot of times people are overwhelmed. You know, They finally come to this realization, I have a problem. What do I do about it? Who do I turn to? This is embarrassing. You know, this isn't like alcoholism or something I could talk to my employer about. This is something people might think of me as some guy in a trench coat flashing self to kids. And all I do is look at a little bit of porn. You know, so there's there's a lot of shame and embarrassment around it. So what I want to emphasize is you really need to go to go out there and be your own advocate. Look for help. There's plenty of help out there. You know, obviously we're here talking about compulsion solutions. We're one of many. There's lots of help out there, and if I really encourage you to call me because if we can't help you personally, I'll, I'll refer you to somebody who can. Uh, but we're really vested in you getting well. So hopefully that gets to the three possible first steps. Admit there's no there's a problem, bottom, on, bottom, off, bottom out enough to go look for help, and then actually go about getting support and doing it. Hey, James. Yes. Um, I just want to go ahead and uh, if you can type in the chat your um, your information for everyone to 
get a hold of you if okay. necessary. Okay. I think you can miss all attendees. But I think we have about two minutes left before we might get kicked out of this, this whole system, like I was earlier. But um, if you want to go ahead and give you information, that would be really helpful. But we really appreciate um, everyone attending and all your comments and questions. Um, if you want information, like I said, about compulsion solutions and um, contact information to James, he will hopefully give that to you right now. And also for more event information from Morality and Media, log on to www.cornharms.com slash be aware and look for more events like these um, where we're just wrapping up our addiction week this week. Um, so there you go. Hopefully everyone got that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I just went ahead and put yeah. this uh, the blurb about our website, uh, my email, and the number here to our main office. Uh, I work with George Collins, so you might get George who answers, uh, or myself. So uh, if you get George, by all means, talk to him as well. He's he's, he's present and he's uh, very uh, he's here actually at the meeting with me in this room, and he knows he'll be here to support you as, as will I. So if you're struggling with this, don't sit on this. Do something. Make a plan. Get help. Great. Thank you so much, James, and thank you everyone who attended. We appreciate it. Um, have a good night, and thanks for attending. Thank you very much, guys.